<laughs> okay, I think we should get going. Um, uh, we're delighted to have today uh, Holly Barkas, who is uh, Associate Professor of Geography at uh, McAllister. And uh, um, she uh, uh, received her PhD in 1990, no, 2001 uh, from Kansas State, uh, and she wrote on composition, motivations, and residential consequences of rural urban migration in the United States. So she's had many, many publications since then, uh, uh, but uh, recently uh, many of them have focused on uh, Asia rather than um, on the United States, and we're going to hear about one of those today. And I would like to uh, present to you uh, the coveted uh, NBC <laughs> seminar series <laughs> mug. Excellent. Which you can only get by presenting the seminar at oh. the, the, in this series. Thank you. I will use it often. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk. I've, I've long admired the work of the Population Center, and, and I'm particularly interested in, in jumping into the IPOMs for, or IPOMs, I guess I've always said it incorrectly, for Mongolia when I started this project. Um, that data set wasn't quite available and it's always been in the back of my mind that pretty soon I can use it and I, I think I'm getting to the point with this project and actually a newer project that I'm working on where I can begin to take advantage of that. So again, thank you for having me and um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to maybe provide some feedback for this project or, or this particular question that we're looking at. I'm going to explore the connection today between place identity and migration decisions and homeland narratives. And these are kind of different dimensions of the literature than, we, that we've, uh, than we've worked in before. And we're trying to link these together conceptually and then through some of our, uh, more of our qualitative data and a little bit of our quantitative data. But it wasn't, this wasn't a topic or a, an area that we went looking for necessarily when we started this project in Mongolia. So maybe just a little background, background before I jump into the presentation. Uh, the concept of place identity is one that links people and place together with a collectively shared sense of social identity and cultural value. The process by which cultural mechanisms, and that's a term that, that we're playing with right now, but the process by which cultural me mechanisms such as religious beliefs kinship ties and linguistic versatility influence the choice to migrate or to remain in place, however, is more poorly understood, although a growing number of scholars are calling for cultural dimensions to be incorporated into the broader literature. We conceptualize place identity through these cultural mechanisms within the migration decision process using the case study of Mongolian Kazakh migration building on some of the integrative theories of migration decision making and migration more broadly to elucidate the embedded dimensions of migration decisions uh, within this emerging transnational community. Now, accompanying the 1991 USSR dissolution and formation of new nation states, nearly 50% of Mongolian Kazakhs chose to migrate from their adopted home of Mongolia to their imagined homeland of Kazakhstan. The economic transitions of Mongolia and Kazakhstan and repatriation programs offered by Kazakhstan <coughs> facilitated this migration. By 2000, however, and this is where our interest comes in, nearly 50% of those who had left Mongolia initially returned to Mongolia from Kazakhstan. Although economic reasons were important, most respondents said that they returned to Mo Mongolia for non-economic reasons, which when we think about international migration, isn't what we generally hear. You know, economic decisions are often right at the core of those decisions. Many of these um, migrants identified such things as ancestral burial grounds, um, the flavor of food, uh, the connection to local places as reasons for returning to Mongolia. Now, so when we think more broadly about concepts of place identity, usually place identity is associated with an individual. And in this case, we begin to argue or to think about place identity as being identified with a group. And how is it that we can move that level of place identity from the individual to the group 
and then also tie it in more broadly to migration decisions uh, in the transnational context. All right, so I've, I'm just, I've organized this presentation really around the key areas of, of our current paper, the one we're, we're working on right now, uh, and beginning with just that conceptual link between place and migration decisions, and then an overview of our research and methodology, and then what we're calling um, cultural mechanisms. So these are the three that, that I'll talk about a little bit today. And then we'll return to that question of whether or not we can link migration and place identity together, at least conceptually, and using a little bit, bit of these data, and then offer a few concluding comments. All right, so conceptually, well, we're drawing in a, uh, several different elements of the migration literature first, and then I'll talk about a couple other dimensions as well as we move um, through the talk. But first and foremost, I think we started this project thinking about some of the behavioral approaches to, to migration decision making, or what Boyle et al. referred to as the mechanisms behind individual acts of migration. Why do individuals choose to migrate? Sort of alongside that, we've been looking um, at a region <coughs> of the world that has been less explored in terms of individual migration decision making. Uh, and so migration decision making is much more dependent upon the rules and norms here, and social conventions of particular groups and social networks of particular communities in the developing world than it is maybe in the developed world. And then we, we contextualize, contextualize that as well within this idea of the cultural turn in migration studies, that while the cultural turn has, uh, is almost over in the developed world, at least according to Smith and King, um, when we really look at that literature, it's very much focused on the US and the UK and Europe more broadly. In other words, we really have little work done in terms of migration decision making in a developing world context within at least the broader geographic migration literature. And then lastly, lastly at least in terms of migration, thinking about structuration theory, which we really just look at as, as, a, at as a contextual piece where we're well, we want to link structure and agency. So we're essentially arguing that place identity is, is a cultural structure, if you will, and we're hoping that's not too strong of a way of framing it. But that structures, um, according to Giddon, are recursive, meaning that they're created and recreated and reinforced by actions of individuals and communities. And so that if we think about individual agency and all the reasons why an individual might move, we also think of these broader societal structures as reasons that might um, contextualize or influence that decision that are held in common by a larger group of people. Right, so I want to start with that behavioral side. When migration uh, decisions are influenced by a range of factors, but we can think just for example, oops, wrong button, here with the individual decisions, and this is of course a, a short list, but if you were to just brainstorm the reasons why people move, and we think about that individual level modeling um, of migration decisions, these are the ones that first come into, into play. Age, gender, sex, employment, income, education, and so forth. And then the broader, just examples of the broader structures that we might think about. Legal, obviously, with transnational groups, uh, migration processes, or international migration, we think of immigration laws, or laws that might keep a population in place, or propel them out of a place. Uh, different levels of economic fluctuations, fluctuations that might privilege opportunity in one location over, over another, or in the case of Mongolian Kazakhs, the availability of government incentives to move from Mongolia into Kazakhstan. But then we also have, and this, these largely come about in, in the literature in the US and more broadly in Europe, these ideas of sociocultural structures, uh, things like uh, patriarchal systems in which decisions at an individual level might reflect a broader structure of patriarchy that might privilege one earner over another earner. Okay? And so the family might move, but that decision to move, we move it from the individual to the family to this broader level. And we're placing place identity here right now. And again, we're still kind of playing with some of these ideas. So but if we consider that place identity is one of these broader structures, then while it's individually interpreted, it's conditioned by these other socio-cultural socio structures as well, such that when a culture places a high utility on place and inscribes place into its meaningful, broader identity, then that place identity 
becomes part of the migration decision. Or so we're arguing. Okay, so acknowledging Smith and Bailey's call to reinscribe place into migration studies, we turn to the idea of place identity itself. So in the early 1980s, Prashansky <coughs> Uh, define place identity as a substructure of self-identity, that it includes cognitions about the physical world of the individual, and it can include attitudes, values, feelings, memories, and meanings inclusive of their past interactions with a particular physical environment. It also includes associations with people set within this environment and varies by social demographic characteristics of individuals and is mediated by life stage. So Proshansky really uh, portrayed place identity as an individual substructure of self-identity. But Harner, Harner writing uh, in the early 2000s, began to argue that we can link these individual place identity feelings or attributes to broader social groups. And, and essentially what he, he says is that place identity is a cultural value shared by a community it's a collective understanding of social identity intertwined with place meaning. So now we've moved from the individual to this slightly broader group uh, and associated a place with a group of people. And this is where we begin to think about the idea of a structure or a context in which a group of migrants might change or alter their migration decision based on place identity. And so then in traditional societies, Place identity is created and reinforced and medi mediated by cultural practices explicitly. Okay, another thread of the literature that, that impacts this particular group are our homelands, or the homeland, uh, no, the notion of a homeland. In considering migration decisions about changing geo, in considering migration decisions across the rapidly changing geopolitical boundaries of Central Asia in particular, and I think you could broaden this as well, the concepts of homelands and the way in which they're employed in regional and local discourses also begin to play into this broader migration decisions. So it is through the homeland narratives then that Mongolian Kazakhs that we begin to glimpse how place and place identity intersects with the influences and influences migration. So this is one of many, many quotes that it just as Kazakhstan is our homeland, Mongolia is our fatherland, my ancestors are here, not only migrate if everyone else leaves. Well, we heard this from almost every single respondent that we had. This idea that homeland and fatherland are not synonymous, that there's this divided identity with these places. And we were, we were really very interested in, in why it is that we have this division, because one is really at this meta scale, meta scale and these meta narratives about homeland, and the other one is at a very local or individual or community scale, the idea of the fatherland. Okay. So the questions that we're, we're thinking about here are what role does place play in the decision to migrate, very specifically, and then can we identify ethnocultural structures that influence individual agency in deciding to migrate or to remain in place. So we argue that place identity as expressed through cultural mechanisms is a social structure that mediates individual agency in the context of migration decisions that while it is ultimately individual bodies that migrate, cultural dimensions such as religious practices, kinship ties, and linguistic abilities are important facilitators and inhibitors of migration. Now our caveat is that while we're focusing on place identity, and that's essentially all what I'm going to talk about today, that we're not suggesting that these are the primary reasons for making migration decisions, right? So we, we embed this in, in the discussions about behavioral decisions or behavioral migration decisions and the idea <coughs> that there are these other broader factors that are, are, are often much more important, economic factors being key in this population. Rather, we assert that outside of Western context, place identity as perpetuated by cultural mechanisms may play a larger role uh, in influencing migration that has previously been acknowledged in the literature. So if you think about migration models that, that are predictive, and we think about uh, the ability to predict whether or not a particular person based on a certain set of um, characteristics is likely to move, we know that those models at best are hitting at 70% explanatory power. So what is that remaining 30%? Well, in, the develop in many developing world contexts, that explanatory power is even less than that 70%. And so, 
we're looking at that, that smaller realm of how migration decision making or what affects migration decision making. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief context, background on who this population is and why, why we're asking these questions and, and maybe why, why they're important at this point in time. Okay, so our research focuses on the Mongolian Kazakhs. So we call them Mongolian Kazakhs because migration to Kazakhstan, uh, the, the return of that diaspora community, is, um, engages a number of different nations. And so Mongolian just sets aside this particular group. Um, they arrived in Western Mongolia, and I'll show you a map in a second, in the 1860s, and they have lived in this area now for a number of generations. So by anyone's memory, this is the <coughs> homeland of, this is their most consistent, most local homeland. In 1989, the population was about 120,000. And then between 1990 and 2000, which was the next census, uh, the population by the census numbers didn't fluctuate a whole lot. There's, a, I think, 100 to 110 are the different, are the different numbers that, that we've come up with. But essentially, during the 1990s, we had this flux. And we're able to get to some of these numbers by other documents, whether they're um, logs of migrants who are entering Kazakhstan or uh, flight itineraries. We know that somewhere between 50 and 60,000 left. And then, and this is around about 93, 94 was the major outmigration. And then returning in 1997, 8 and 9, we see that approximately 30,000, so 20 to 30 is, is somewhat, is the estimate, returned to Mongolia. For those who are returning, most of their reasons for returning were non-economic. I'll come back to that. Mongolian Kazakhs are different from Mongols in, the, in two primary ways, by language and religion. So Kazakh uh, the Kazakh population in Western Mongolia speaks Kazakh. Uh, the Mongol population, of course, speaks Mongolian. And the language of inter-ethnic communication is, is Mongolian. Uh, by religion, Mongolian Kazakhs, or Kazakhs in general, are, are Muslim, whereas Mongols are Buddhist. Now, these are important delimiters, because this is a very small population overall in Mongolia. Okay, so we're, we are working in the province that has the greatest concentration of Kazakhs, but they still comprise only about 4% of the population. This group, the Halka population, is ethnic Mongol uh, population. So there's very low level of minorities in Mongolia in general. The Kazakh population is the largest, and it's largely concentrated in the western province. Um, when we look at traditional livelihoods and gender roles, they're very similar across the two different populations both semi-nomadic uh, pastoralists, pastoral economy. They migrate in fairly regular patterns across the landscape. And as my co-author likes to say, are, while they are uh, semi-nomadic, they don't move willy-nilly across the, the steppe. There's, there are very established patterns. And this is where we begin to identify place and culture or link those two together in these more structured uh, movements within Mongolia. And then lastly, Bayanogi is a province that we're in, Bayanogi, Olgi, Aymak, uh, is a remote border province. It has border crossings between Bayanogi in China, Bayanogi in Russia, and international flights to Kazakhstan. And the international flights are more recent, or the late 1990s, more recent than the early 1990s. Okay, so this is where we're, we're working up here in the Altai mountain range, and so if you think of a geopolitical landscape that had no borders or very loosely in enforced borders uh, in the 1860s, you can understand why we have Kazakh populations that are spread throughout this area and have now become members of other nation states. We also know that this is where we work. We were, this is Bayan Olgi, this dark green one. Mongolia and Kazakhstan are not connected. There's a 60-kilometer mountainous territory between them owned by Russia and China. So this migration is not border across one border. It's either direct by, by air or it's through, generally through Russia. I don't think people, I know people don't generally move through, through China. Primary reason for out migration were economic factors. So in the early 1990s, Mongolia, um, which was never um, a state, was never part of the Soviet Union, although they were heavily influenced by the Soviet Union, but they went through this period of uh, economic turmoil when their major trading partner, Russia, or the former Soviet Union, withdraw in the early 1990s. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, this large contingent of uh, Mongolian Kazakhs left for Kazakhstan, and the rationale was quite clear. 
uh, economic turmoil left many without livelihoods. There is no paved road between Ulaanbaatar and, and, by, and Olgi, which is the major town here. And in fact, the road ends about right here. So this, at best, is a four-day trip, and this is 20 years post-transition, four-day trip by Jeep. Um, and so this is a remote province. So proximity to Ulaanbaatar versus proximity to cities in western Kazakhstan is also an important factor here. Lastly, the homeland narrative, not lastly, but the homeland narrative is also key because Nazarbayev, um, then and current president of Kazakhstan, recalled or called back all of um, all Kazakhs from outside of Kazakhstan. Now his primary motivation is political. Uh, in 1990, the early 1990s, Kazakhs comprised less than 50% of the total population in Kazakhstan. So they were an ethnic, major ethnic minority in what they deemed to be their own country. And so the return migrants, um, <coughs> pejoratively called Oroman in, in Kazakhstan, were called back uh, through presidential addresses, through radio, through television, and as internet emerged more through internet as well. But it wasn't just this verbal callback. It was also incentive programs that paid for Kazakhs to go back to Kazakhstan. So um, one-time payment per family member that moved to Kazakhstan from Mongolia, payment of all transport of your family and all of, all of your um, all of your possessions, five-year work contracts, housing, and livestock were all provided once they got to Kazakhstan. So this is sort of in that mix of why do people move to Kazakhstan? Well, th it was clear why they left. Okay? The economic incentives uh, for moving in and the economic disincentives for staying. In previous talks, I've talked a little bit about the three periods of migration and how we see this evolution from uh, large-scale family migrations to individual more circul circulatory migrations. So now with the, the rise of telecommunication systems, you can stand in a remote province or a remote area <coughs> of Bayan Olgi, and you can text your cousins and your neighbors or whoever in Kazakhstan, you can find out that there's work there and that if you get on the bus next week, you can go and take, take up that work. 20 years ago, it was, a th it was a letter that came every three months. So the rapidness by which people can move back and forth across these borders has increased dramatically um, as compared to the beginning. Okay, so our preliminary research started in 2006. And as, uh, as you can see from, from the picture here, our primary reason for doing this preliminary research was really to see if it was feasible because this represents two interviews. There's two yurts you can't see here. This is a family unit, or an awul, and this is another one. And we are really interested in interviewing households, and this is essentially an extended household. But this was a four-hour trip, and each interview is, an, is a two-hour commitment. So in one day, in one very, very long day, we could accomplish two interviews. So the prospect of being able to do this during the summer season when when folks are in their summer pastures is logistically somewhat challenging. And so our, sur our ultimate sur sample size is about 184 households um, spread across this IMOG. But that's one of the reasons why it's quite small. All right, so that was our preliminary re research. We wanted to, to test some questions. We wanted to see if we could logistically do this. In 2008, we came back and we conducted semi-structured uh, life history interviews and a more structured questionnaire. Questionnaire has 200 questions on it, um, inclusive of a more household income dynamic, and then uh, more questions to individual migrants. And then we went back in 2009 for some follow-up interviews. This is our general um, quota. We used a nested quota sample. We were interested in seeing a number of different dimensions of why people migrate from one place to another. And our primary <laughs> division was migrant to non-migrant. Um, the first number is our surveys, the second one are our life history interviews, and then we've divided them across rural and urban. These are very loosely defined. An urban place is Olgi, which is the central town in uh, Bayan Olgi, uh, it's a population of 30 to 40,000, uh, and then across age and gender as well. And then we also, on a more loose scale, we incorporated different socioeconomic dimensions, which are more difficult to, to ascertain right away. Okay, and then I want to layer in one more dimension here, and that before I get to some of our, our data, and that is the homeland narrative. So when we think about three con 
contemporary near historic national scale structural factors that are particularly salient in understanding Kazakh migration between Mongolia and Kazakhstan, we think first about these economic and political changes. I would just leave that there. But we can also think about homeland narratives as compelling migration to Kazakhstan. But these are pervasive meta-narratives meta that are tightly intertwined and coupled with these strategic immigration policies and incentives from the Kazakhstani government. Okay, so we have these factors that are they're making this process <coughs> quite a bit more fuzzy. This isn't a, a one-time economic decision. It's a longer-term uh, d decision that's embedded within these other dimensions. So then the prominence and importance placed on repatriation to ethnic Kazakhs to the homeland helped establish a framework for immigration in Kazakhstan and integration policies that help Kazakh migrants return to uh, what I, I refer to as, as the homeland. <coughs> they also act as a major reason for incentivizing migration. When we ask people about the homeland, though, and how they feel about the homeland relative to, to other factors. And, and we ask these questions in a number of different ways, but I'll just highlight a few. Um, the first one here, do you, how, how strongly do you agree that all Kazakhs should live in the Kazakh homeland of Kazakhstan? And you can see that even 15 years on, 77 almost percent of the population is very keen to identify themselves with the Kazakhstani homeland. This is where Kazakhs should live. We can look at things like preservation of culture. The majority agree that if they live in Kazakhstan, they will feel much closer to Kazakh cultural traditions. And then by religion, we talk about religion, it's easier to be Muslim in Kazakhstan. It's easier to teach our children about Islam in Kazakhstan. But interestingly enough, by language, it's not easier to live in Kazakhstan. In fact, um, it's, it's not very easy at all to live in Kazakhstan and educate your children in the Kazakh language or to use the Kazakh language in daily living. So language, you know, while language is always a facilitator or inhibitor of migration, I don't think that's in question, but I think in this context, we have a group of, or a population that's moving to a place that they perceive as their homeland, and they perceive that everyone there is going to um, embrace the same cultural traditions that they themselves have embraced for generations. And this is an isolated population moving to a much more Russified, much more dynamic and globally connected society in Kazakhstan. And what they find when they get there is that they are the anomaly. That their native language or their native tongue is not what's spoken in Kazakhstan. And in fact, it is one of the reasons why they're discriminated against in what they perceive to be as their homeland. Okay, so if we then turn our attention a little bit to what we're, we're thinking of as, as cultural mechanisms, I'm just going to give three examples here. Cultural practices um, such as religious practices, ancestor worship and shrine visitation, linguistic versatility, or the ability to converse comfortably in a range of languages. So it's not just Mongolian and Kazakh that we're thinking about, it's Russian, English, Chinese, and <coughs> Arabic as well. And depending on what your utility is with any of these languages, that will very much determine where you're going to migrate if you migrate at all. And then lastly, the idea of kin networks, which is not so much just the social networks, but it's the perpetuation of social networks in a particular place and how these are referenced um, by uh, the, the narratives that are told within different groups or within different um, social groups. All right, so Islam, as I said, is a key component of Kazakh identity. And after years of religious repression, the Kazakhs are experiencing a revival of Islam, as witnessed by the emergence of new mosques and increased opportunities for Kazakhs to study Islam both in Mongolia and abroad. And despite these trends, many Kazakhs, both in Mongolia and in Kazakhstan, do not follow the basic Muslim tenets of reciting prayers five times a day and fasting during Ramadan. For Mongolian Kazakhs, ethnic identity and religious identity are deeply intertwined. There is no separation between these identities. To be Kazakh is to be Muslim. Well, only 14% of Kazakhs actually recite namaz daily. So the daily recitation of prayers, very, very small percentage of Kazakhs actually adhere to this. And yet, if we were to ask about religion and how important religion is, then 
almost to, to a person, to be Cossack is to be Muslim. Uh, and, and so there's this very deep connection with, um, with religion. However, it manifests in different ways. So because religion was repressed to such an extent in Mongolia during what, what our respondents would call the Red Period, um, different forms, different very particular cultural mechanisms or cultural forms have emerged. One is the idea of ancestral burial sites. Uh, here it's 72% say that's an important reason why they would not migrate, that they would stay at these ancestral burial sites. Okay, and so when we think about these, one of, um, and I'm going to get to this in just a second, but I want to foreshadow it a little bit with, with this. All my relatives are here, and so I want to live here. Mongolia is my fatherland. All my ancestors, and this is what I've added, are buried here. So relatives are the present, ancestors are my past, and this is a connection to a very particular place. So uh, Mongolian Kazakhs live in particular clan-based um, concentrations within Mongolia. <coughs> Attachment to a birth site and a, and a burial site of ancestors is very, very important to the sense of clan identity and individual identity. So we see the, the movement of individual identity uh, being linked with this place through, excuse me, through religion. Okay, and then I think maybe just as an aside, it's interesting that we have two groups that, are, that very much uh, respond to this question in the same way, and those are the youth who were largely born and raised outside of the Red Period, and the older group that lived through the Red Period and largely practiced religion in secret during, the, during, during that period. Okay, so I've, in foreshadowing sort of the religious side of it or some of these religious beliefs, I want to get to this because this is very geographically specific. Um, when we look at historic settlement patterns, we know that they reinforce place ties for this particular population. So this social importance of clan identity and the corresponding concentration of lineages creates these strong lin linkages between land and a particular place and its incorporation into the social identity of individuals and families. So some of the, some of the quotes that, that come to mind from return migrants are, the food and the water tasted different. Kazakhstan, uh, their meat isn't quite the same. And this n never made a lot of sense to us until we started really picking this apart. And it's not just that the livestock is raised in a different place, it's that there's a very strong attachment to a particular pasture, not just Mongolia. I think the idea of being attached to the nation state doesn't exist, but a particular pasture in Western Mongolia is very, is very ingrained. And so Finke, Finke produced a map a number of years ago that laid out the clan affiliation. So the maximal lineages of Kazakh populations are very much geographically concentrated uh, within this Bayanolgi Aymak. And so you have generations of families who have moved around in the same pastures on the same rotational schedule um, linking to these particular spaces. We can think of talking to one of our one of our families one time, and I asked, I asked them if they came to this, this, this place, and I just use a generic term of place, every year. And, and, and the mother of the family looked at me and she said, well, no. Last year, and we walked outside, she said, last year we were over there, meaning the yurt was 100 yards to the right. <laughs> and so it was, so place just becomes very much entwined with who you are, where you're born, and where your ancestors are buried. And so this continuity then is extended into current families. So family after family after family lives here. And we get that again over and over in our, in our, in our notes that we miss the land, we miss the meat, we missed the water. It's all different in Kazakhstan. Therefore, we shouldn't stay in Kazakhstan. We need to come back to where we're familiar with these things. And then this is perpetuated more uh, through current family practices. So we have families that work together and herd together every summer and the survival of these families is very much oriented or engaged across these families. So all my relatives here, I want to stay here. And if we look, these are several different families. And if you're going to shear a thousand sheep, then you need a number of people to do it. And so you have these, these sort of 
um, agreements across families, with across owls, but also within them that continue to reinforce this identity of place and long-term traditions. So we're thinking of that as a, one of the elements or mechanisms of place identity. Um, if we look at these, I think what's interesting about these, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, is how we learn about Kazakhstan and Kazakhstani life and how the appropriate place to do that is largely <coughs> in Kazakhstan. But if we actually want to practice being Kazakh, we do that in Mongolia. And it's an interesting division, right, between where we can learn about it, where the cultural home is, but where we can actually practice being part of this culture. OK, and so the last, the last component that we're looking at is linguistic versatility. So we know that linguistic versatility is often the product of exposure to and dependence upon a particular set of languages. But languages are both universal and place specific, with specific dialects um, developing particular geographic places. So for Mongolian Kazakhs, widely recognized as having preserved historic Kazakh traditions in part because of their isolation in Western Mongolia, linguistic versatility is both, both a product of location and of age. So they've retained their knowledge of the native tongue. They speak it fluently across this region. But as a semi-autonomous province, and by having been given this freedom to, to choose that particular language, it's been preserved in a way that it hasn't in Kazakhstan. So in Kazakhstan, it's a secondary at best language. It, the primary la language is Russian. And Mongolian Kazakhs leave for Kazakhstan fully expecting that they're going to be welcomed into this community in Kazakhstan and they are partially going to be welcomed because they speak this language and they have similar cultural traditions, which is not the case. They're actually outcast because they are non-Russian speaking or they don't speak it, many of them don't speak it quite well. However, for those who are going to, to migrate, they need these additional languages. So just living in Mongolia, you speak <coughs> Mongolian. You may not be fluent or completely literate, rather, in Mongolian, but you will speak Mongolian. However, if, you're, if your family was of a particular social class during the Red Period, you would also have been um, trained in Russian, and you may have attended a Russian university. Um, but increasingly, Russia's not while they may be a trading partner, they're not, they're not as revered as more of the English-speaking world, Australia, Canada in particular, because of the economic development opportunities that these particular countries offer to, to, um, to Mongol Mongolians broadly, uh, or Chinese. So Chinese isn't a language that we run into very often. Um, Mongolians, broadly, as a nation state, have an, uh, sort of an anti-Chinese stance. While the largest group of migrant workers now in Mongolia is Chinese, it's not, a f not necessarily a friend. It's always been a very contentious relationship. Uh, and then the last language, which I don't have here, is Arabic, uh, which, with the um, ties to religion, we see a lot of, um, um, what am I trying to say? people coming in from Turkey in particular looking for uh, or looking to promote Islam within the community of Bayanolgi. And so within these schools then they teach English, Arabic, and, and Kazakh to some extent. Uh, but if you want to migrate to Turkey, then you would, you would pick up a broader set of languages and in particular Arabic because, uh, because of the religious ties. Okay, and so we see this range of languages but when we think about it in this broader, maybe this transnational migration sense, your ability to migrate is directly tied to your, your um, utility with any one of these languages and where you're going and where you're going to be successful is tied to these languages. So when we see return migration or, fit or a decision not to migrate, oftentimes we, when we dig a little bit deeper, we're also finding with this population that those who are not proficient in anything other than Kazakh or Mongolian are choosing not to migrate or they're choosing to return home. So we have this other cultural structure that says that, or substructure rather, that says that if you are really Kazakh, you stay in Mongolia because this is where the Kazakhs speak this particular language, this is where your ancestors are, and these are the um, sort of the religious practices that begin to bring all of these together. 
Okay, so this is more, these are more communally held ideas. Okay, so going back, I'm almost, I know I'm just about out of time. So going back just for, for a second, if Prashansky described place identity as a substructure of self-identity, and as I said, Harner then postulated that it's part of a social identity or a place-based identity for groups. So we bring this place identity up to this broader scale. The incorporation of place as self and as a connection between self and society creates strong linkages then between particular geographic spaces and individuals' perception or conception of self and ultimately well-being. So we've argued here that place identities expressed through cultural factors or cultural mechanisms such as linguistic ability and kinship ties and religious beliefs, and that it both inhibits outmigration and um, encourages return migration uh, for at least a subset of, the, of this population. And then we also, like I said, we invoke Giddens structuration theory to help us contextualize how individual agency can transcend all social or many social structures, and that place identity really is one of those that is um, engaged and it's created, it's recreated as these different generations begin to migrate back and forth to, my, to Kazakhstan, and then also as they begin to change those expectations of what it means to be, to be Kazakh. Okay, and then so four Mongolian Kazakhs who are largely isolated, um, s ethnic social identity begins to permeate the identity of the broader group and strongly ties them to particular places. And so while it's individually adhered to and somewhat nuanced, it reproduces place identity and in turn reinforces these connections to Western Mongolia and influences migration decisions. So then just, like I said, we're, we're still kind of playing with these ideas, but what, but what we're working with right now is that religious practices, linguistic versatility, and kinship networks as general ideas reinforce this idea of place identity for Mongolian Kazakhs, and that this plays a role in influencing how uh, different members of this population make migration decisions, and that it is much more important, I would say, than it is in more Western contexts, that this adherence to a particular social identity, and that social identity is tied to a particular place, than it would be in more Western contexts. And then we, ha we do have a, this conflict, this ongoing conflict between the symbolic connection uh, to the imagined homeland of Kazakhstan and the and place identity in Mongolia. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there. So just to acknowledge some of our funders and many, many research assistants both in the US and in Mongolia. And then if there's any questions. Thank you. So you're all convinced that. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. Yeah. Like those that came back to Mongolia, mm. they sent remittances or something back to Kazakhstan? Or? You know, interestingly enough, everyone denies sending money back to Mongolia. So they started in Mongolia, they went to Kazakhstan, and those who stayed in Kazakhstan have denied, you just cross the board, denied that they send money back. Now, we've gone at it a hundred different ways. And the best response is that, well, we get some gifts back. Uh, when people come to visit, they bring gifts, but not so much remittances, which we're still trying to tease out because it just defies everything we know about migration and the transfer of funds. But nonetheless, we, we <laughs> we've come across no, without exception, that they're not sending remittances back to Mongolia, at least not in a way that we're able to tease out yet. Yeah. Yeah. Considering those two uh, factors, do you find any differences among groups? There are differences among groups. So uh, we have these three broader groups. We have the young, 18 to 29, and then 30 to 45 and 45 and older. The younger group is looking for education, and so they largely they choose to be educated in Ulaanbaatar or or in Kazakhstan. So Kazakh. Kazakhstan provided education incentives. If you wanted to come to Kazakhstan and go to college, that was great. Come on, 
you know, come on over and we're going to provide some level of education. So we've out migration there uh, for that younger group to Kazakhstan, also to Turkey, and to a lesser extent to Canada, Australia, and the United States. But that's a very small group. So for young people, it's in search of education and, and economic opportunities as well. So Kazakhstan um, has been spending a lot of time building infrastructure and buildings and so on. And a lot of construction workers come from Western Mongolia. So you, you, if you're young, you're going on two paths. Uh, construction, which is temporary, and education, which, which often leads to more permanent migration. Uh, if you're older, if you're in that much older group, then the likelihood is that you went to Kazakhstan, you came back, and that's the group that has a, the strongest place identity, right? So we, and that's not surprising, right? As you get older, you have stronger connections to particular places. So that group gives us the strongest feedback on return migration. And the middle group is actually very, very diverse and really hard to predict. So yes, I mean, we definitely do see differences across the <coughs> major mo indicators of migration differences that you would, that you would expect. I have a few questions about the um, Islam and the sense of place and sense of time. And I know you didn't have a chance to really talk about the time dimension right. in your presentation. But um, let me start by saying the sig I didn't understand the significance of the fact that only 40% pray daily, because that's common throughout all of Central Asia. Okay. In fact, somebody, uh, I think they, they may have been Israeli scholars, judging by their names, but they they did a survey of religious practice, maybe you've seen that research, and, and, and of the five sort of aspects of Islam that many people associate with being Muslim, mm -hmm. those are not very commonly practiced throughout Central mm -hmm. Asia. But people still strongly identify as Muslim. And what I, I guess what I'm curious about with respect to the, to the case that you've presented today is to what extent are ancestors seen as people who are dead, buried in the ground buried in a particular burial place, or is the landscape populated by ancestors who are alive? Is the, is the landscape, is the sense of time such that the past is in front of people? Is, is there a sense of time in the sense that young people and older people are the ones who are closest to the ancestors because they're the ones coming from a certain place of, of religious sensibility and then going to it because they're they're end of their life? I mean, these sorts of questions, these are kinds of questions that I have. And yeah. so I think if I judge your presentation correctly, I'm, I'm much less likely to, to insert that word burial in there, for example, when people are talking about ancestors. I, I, think, I think what you've said is, first of all, it's, it, it, it's interesting to connect the generations. We hadn't, hadn't thought of it quite like that before. But this is, in this case, there is, there is that physical space. It's one of those, um, the shrine visitations, I know my, my understanding of shrine visitation is that in, particularly in Kazakhstan, these are usually very important people and you would visit a shrine and perhaps uh, make a pilgrimage to a particular shrine. In Mongolia, it's much more family based in that these shrines are located in particular areas within these concentrated clan areas. And one dimension of it is that they are making this track to the burial site. Now, whether or not um, that's also connected through time to the, to the youth is a, is a fascinating question. I'm not, I'm not certain. And I think, but other people have mentioned the burial and is it actually a place? And it is in this case. And we've really teased that out with, with our different respondents because that was really surprising to us. We, we thought of ancestors as being people who live in this space, you know, broadly. But they said, no, we go to a particular place. And this was one thing that we could do during the Red Period that allowed us to continue to feel Muslim that wasn't um, prohibited or not explicitly prohibited. So this one does have a place base. And I don't know if, I mean, I, my knowledge of Islam is not extensive. And so I don't know if that's significantly different or just slightly different from where it's practiced elsewhere. But the question about um, the youth, you know, part of that, uh, I guess in my opinion, I attributed to um, 
the youth, because it was at the same time that they were coming of age that we see the missionaries arrive in Mongolia. And um, the scholarships offered for those who are devout to go study in Turkey, that, that there's, there's something else there with the youth population as well. And we also see the rise of access to broader communication systems that tie into um, these more global narratives about what Islam is rather than that more localized understanding of what religion is. So I, I mean, hopefully I'm not completely off base in answering your question. Does that give you a sense of where we're going or what we're thinking? Well, I guess I just, I just, I, I don't, I've never been to the Syria, so I don't yeah. know, and, and I haven't read enough literature on this particular area, but just speaking purely as a cultural anthropologist, I'm, I, I'm, cautious in ascribing Western linear notions of time mm -hmm. and place onto peoples who may have very different understandings. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it's a complicated case with, as you mentioned, this idea of transnational Islam or Islam um, being uh, imported, a sense of Islam being imported from Turkey and other places mm -hmm. with local practices and local ways of being Muslim. Right. I mean, it's, it's not a simple... No, and right, and like I said, we've, I mean, I'd love to have more conversations because I want to be sure that we're, we're thinking about this right. And, and, and the, place I, the, the place aspect of it we're, we're fairly confident in, but some of the other conceptualizations, yeah, could certainly be tweaked. Thank you. Yeah. Just curious about what, how significant a difference you noticed on some of those questions about belief, about where it's easier to practice certain things between the people who had not migrated and people who had migrated and come back? Statistically, there weren't significant differences. So um, we had, actually I have it in my notes, that when we ran tests of differences, they weren't significant. And you're looking at something like um, it was like 78% and 81% of the two different groups. Now, I remember, and this is with the caveat, this is a small population, right? So we're, I'm reluctant to place a lot of emphasis on the statistics and more that they're a general. The people were fairly clear, though. Either they did or they didn't think that. And the vast majority felt strongly about um, being able to practice being Kazakh in, and those are my words, in in Mongolia rather than learning about it in, in Kazakhstan. So it, yeah, even across the urban rural, across uh, male, female, and across the age group were the different dimensions that we compared the responses. They weren't much different. Mm. Well, you know, interestingly enough, their, their perceptions are largely positive. So, so I only showed you Eugene, just a few questions about comparing life in Mongolia and Kazakhstan. And for most people, these are imaginations of what Kazakhstan is like. Uh, but the vast, I would say the majority, and without looking at the numbers, but over 50% would say that Kazakhstan is more modern, it's easier, it's particularly easier for women. Women have more freedoms. Um, the education is better. If you have young children, you should go to Kazakhstan because they can be better educated there. So I, the perception is quite positive. However, there, there, are, there, there is a group that also says yes, but it's really very difficult. If, if you can make it, and this is where our discussions of language often come out, if you already have an occupation, and if you are fluent in Russian in particular, then your life can be much better. But if you aren't those two things, then it might, it might be hard, but it's still a better place to be. So it's an interesting, life might be harder, but it's, it's, it's still revered as, as a good place to go. So I, I mean, we haven't yet seen people say, well, it's, even if their experience is bad, this is a horrible place to go. It's still, and I think that's where the idea of the homeland comes in, that 
the dominant narrative is that Kazakhstan is the place where Kazakhs should be. And, and people tend not to vary from that a, a whole lot, even if they've made completely different choices. Yes, everyone is related to someone who's moved to Kazakhstan. So uh, the magnitude of migration, it wasn't, so when almost 50% of the population moved, it wasn't from one place. It was from all these smaller towns um, across, across Mongolia, but dominantly in Bayanogi. And we had people tell us that it was like a war, that, that the, the big Kamas trucks the big would come through town, they'd load up everybody's goods, and then the people would leave by bus or by airplane. And, and so they're really, we've never run into someone who doesn't know someone. They may, you know, 50% of our sample had not migrated themselves, but there was certainly someone in the not too distant family or friends who had migrated. So it's not an unknown. I mean, the stories come back and the and most of the population has access to, to television stations. They see what Kazakhstan is like through the Kazakhstani soap operas, through the, um, um, the news media. I mean, all of that comes via satellite dish into the most remote pastures. So there's no, you know, it's not as if Kazakhstan is imagined in the true sense of I've never seen it. It's imagined. It's imagined through soap operas and newscasts and, and other sort of social media type things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talked a lot about the Kazakh state and the ways that they're trying to kind of capitalize or, or reestablish some of what Kazakh identity means through um, supporting migrants. What's the role of the Mongolian um, government in all this, like in terms of encouraging or discouraging Kazakh identity? To what extent does that influence people's mm -hmm. perceptions of where it's easier to be Kazakh? So that, I, I think that this answer would be quite different if we were in Ulaanbaatar, because I think as an ethnic minority in an ethnic majority um, primary, primary city, the, the response is quite different. But in Bayanolgi, this is a population that is the ethnic majority in their, po in their, in their area. They, um, they are the, the local leaders of the different um, parties, they run the banks, they run all the businesses. So when, the, when we think about what role does the Mongolian government play, I think we also have to think about the kind of the social level. The Mongolian government has largely taken a hands-off approach, except when people start to change their citizenship. And in that case, they've said, you c it's fine if you, if, you, if you leave and you become a Kazakhstani citizen, but it's not fine to come back and then become a Mongolian citizen again. And I mean, we've, we've talked to people who've waited 10, 12 years to have their citizenship in Mongolia re, um, reestablished. Many of them are still waiting. So the Mongolian government has said very little about leaving or, or even coming back and forth. I mean, there's no, you don't need a visa to go back and forth if you're Kazakh to Kazakhstan. You do need one to go through Russia. But the Mongolian government is, only becomes very concerned is if you're trying to switch your citizenship back and forth. And both countries offer fairly, um, I don't want to say extensive, but they both offer social, social safety net mechanisms, so child payments to raise poverty, raise families at least a little bit out of poverty. And those types of benefits are only available if you can prove your citizenship. <coughs> and so it's at the citizenship point rather than the migration point that it becomes, as far as we can tell, becomes more important to the Mongolian state. Is Kazakh living in, in Mongolia better, much better than Kazakhstan now? Not that I can tell. <laughs> I mean, they're both. I mean, they're both in the Altai Mountains. I mean, most. It, it obviously it depends. I mean, Kazakhstan is. They're both enormous. The, the areas. These are the cities that we're largely seeing migration to. The the major. Cities now, obviously, Almaty is going to have a very different climate than um, than Karaganda or Semipalansk, but um, these areas in here are very, very similar. Um, so I think it depends on where they're they're sent to. Uh, Jonathan, uh, my understanding is uh, to a large extent, some of 
lot of the migrants were pastoral and nomadic and then went to positions in Kazakhstan where that was not the case. And how much was that transition of change in way of life a factor in decisions to return? Not just place being in these pastures, but actually being in the You know, I'm not sure. Because when we, when we talk to them about where they went and what they did, there was this transition. Some of them became, so the, the type of farming and agriculture in Kazakhstan is conducted in a very different way than in Western Mongolia. So even if you became a herder in Kazakhstan, you didn't have quite the same, you certainly didn't have uh, the established movement patterns that you had in, in Mongolia. But more likely you were part of a cooperative in which you weren't really independent either, which you are in Mongolia. So I think it all plays into that idea that I'm not as happy here as I was there, and whether it's a level of autonomy or if it's directly connected to a herding practice. Other people said, you know, well, I became a cleaner or I became a construction worker and I actually like that better because I get paid every two weeks or every week or whatever, which is not the case with herding, right? That's a once a year, twice a year paycheck once you've sold your goods. And so I've seen as much positive as negative in terms of whether the job in Kazakhstan was better or worse than the job in Mongolia, whether that's herding or, or otherwise. But job, the ability to move up in your job if you were, for example, a professional, may be more limited in Kazakhstan if you didn't speak Russian. If you spoke Russian, then you, you could do very well, or at least that's the perception. Kazakhstan economically depends on Russia because of market most from Russian territory. They buy their products where that they produce. Mm -hmm. Or uh, they can sell the same with the same <coughs> quantity to Mongolia, to China, to Russia. No, um Mongolia has opened its borders, but they still depend on Russia, especially. So, and, and I'm, they do a lot of trade with Russia. I'm more familiar here with the local level trading rather than the, the larger companies. But the, there's a lot of, um, in particular, one of the largest um, items that comes across the border here is flour. And flour is a staple in the diet. And so, because Russia has these large wheat farming regions and big production factories, that's one of the major shipments that comes across. Uh, most of the trading I'm familiar with is, is much more of that local scale individual traders. And so I'm, I'm not sure I can answer your question comprehensively because I'm not certain. I'm afraid we will run out of time. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm to cut this off. But uh, um, uh, thank you very much and thank you for lively discussion. Thank you.